So I'm Layla Esper. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Carleton College, which is in Minnesota in the United States. Uh, this is my first CGSI, and uh, thus far it's been really lovely. So thank you to the organizers for allowing me to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about some of the projects that have been going on recently in my lab. Um, so tumors are the result of an evolutionary process. And so tumor actually develops as the accumulation of somatic mutations, so mutations that occur during the lifetime of an individual. And so what happens is at some point in the past, some healthy cell acquires a mutation, and this mutation gives that cell sort of a, a replicative advantage, and it starts to replicate. So different descendants of that initial founder cell might acquire different mutations later on in time. So here I'm representing mutations just with these fun little colored blocks. And so what happens then is at any given point in time, a tumor then is going to be a heterogeneous collection of different cells that contain different complements of these somatic mutations. And so this process, this evolutionary process, is referred to as the clonal theory of cancer. And so we can think about sort of describing the history of a tumor using a, a diagram like this. So we can think about cell populations being here along the x-axis. The y-axis is telling us time in different cell divisions. And so I'm using different colors to represent different clones or sets of cells that share the same sets of mutations. And so we don't actually observe this process. Um, so what happens is when a patient is diagnosed, we'll sequence that tumor at a very particular point in time. And it's from that DNA sequencing data that we actually want to go back and infer this evolutionary history. Um, so since I'm a computer scientist, I want to find a more sort of concrete way to represent this. So I might think about representing this as a particular type of rooted tree, where vertices in my tree represent different clones or populations of cells that existed at some point during the evolution of this tumor. And edges are just telling me direct ancestral relationships between those. And so why might we actually want to infer this? One, anything that tells us about how a tumor evolved might be important information for understanding how cancer develops. Furthermore, this can have important implications when we think about patients that relapse or how we treat uh, different patients. So for example, because this tumor is this heterogeneous mixture of different cells, if we wanted to treat a patient with this type of cancer, we might want to say, find a, a complement of um, medications that target mutations on different lineages of this uh, evolution. And that might then allow us to better be able to target the entire set of cells that are in this uh, tumor. So there's been a lot of work that's been done on this area in recent years. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, one, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background about how do we actually infer these evolutionary histories from sequencing data. I don't know about you, but when I first saw this, it feels like magic of being able to sort of like see back into the past. I'm going to tell you about two methods that my group has been working on. So one is a method that allows us to find consensus amongst these trees. So given a set of trees, okay, can we combine them together to get a better inference? And then very much related to that is defining different distance measures on between these trees. How do we actually compare our two trees more or less similar? So one assumption that has commonly been made is this thing called the infinite sites assumption. And so the infinite sites assumption tells us that at no point during the evolution of a tumor did a mutation ever disappear. And once it occurred, it's the only ever time that it ever occurs. And so this assumption relies on the fact that the genome is large, we're assuming mutations are relatively rare, and because the time scale for cancer is relatively short, uh, this was a reasonable assumption to begin with. Um, it also computationally makes the problem a little bit easier. So we're going to start just by thinking about like, how does this assumption actually help us to do this. So if we think about bulk sequencing data, so we sequence the genomes from a whole collection of a set of cells, so again, they're going to have different sets of these mutations. One thing that we might sort of realize from here is, all right, any mutation that is ancestral to another mutation is always going to appear in any cell that has that descendant mutation, because we're assuming that no mutations are ever lost. And so this is actually going to be helpful to us when we start thinking about sequencing data. So we take our reads, we align them to a reference genome, and if we're looking at a single nucleotide variant, we can just look at the reads that align to that position, and we can count the fraction of those reads that have the variant allele. This is our variant allele frequency. And so there's a nice relationship, actually, between variant allele frequency and the sets of cells in a sample that have a mutation. So if we assume there are no copy number aberrations, so our second big assumption thus far, we assume that the variant allele frequency is going to be proportional to the fraction of cells in your sample that have that mutation. 
So once we've realized that, we can start putting together some relationships between ancestral histories. So there's something we call the ancestry condition that tells us if a mutation J is ancestral to mutation K, then certainly it has to have a higher variant allele frequency. Uh, we can generalize this to something called the sum condition, which basically is telling us that, all right, so the set of mutations that are children of a mutation together are going to have to have a sum of their variant allele frequencies is less than their parent. This is just generalizing our ancestral condition. And so these relationships are, allow us to start to think about, all right, if we know something about variant allele frequencies, it might tell us something about the potential ancestral relationships between them. It's not perfect. Um, so how else can we get some more information that helps with this? Another thing that uh, has been done is looking at multi-sample sequencing. And so if we take multiple samples from the same tumor, we expect to see these same relationships consistent across all samples. If they're not, that actually might give us information that two mutations have to be on distinct lineages. So and this is just sort of a whirlwind of some of the ideas, basic ideas that are used to start to reconstruct these tumor evolution trees. Uh, a lot of people have been working on this field in recent years. This is just a small list of, you know, there's been methods that are just on single sample from bulk sequencing, multi-sample from bulk sequencing, things just for single cell. There have been people starting to look at how do we actually relax this infinite sites assumption, uh, something that recently came out specifically looking at longitudinal samples. So there's a lot of work that's been done on here, a lot of work that's still going on. And so the research in my lab recently has focused on rather than let's design yet another method to do this, how do we actually make the output of these methods a little bit more useful? And are there things that we can do that are really going to help us to, to get better inferences at the end of the day? And so the first thing that we started looking at this was uh, a method that allows us to take consensus among a set of conflicting trees. All right, so the, the big question we were asking ourselves is if we have a bunch of different, maybe slightly different trees, can we actually combine them together to get a, a better inference of that? And so there's a lot of different scenarios where this might actually come up. Uh, so some of these methods that do inference are stochastic, so they might actually return different results, uh, different runs. Um, you know, a lot of times you might have single cell and, multi and bulk sequencing, and so you're going to run different methods on those, so you can end up with different results. And then some methods recently have also started to show that you can have multiple different results that are all consistent with a single data set. So there's actually a lot of instances where we might want to say, combine these different trees. Uh, furthermore, that can allow us to actually look at, you know, different methods are going to have different strengths and use different approaches, and this might allow us to better combine some of those together. So the first thing we did was we said, all right, well, lots of people have done consensus before, so let's think about how this is different than how people have done it before by thinking about traditional phylogenetic trees. So in a traditional phylogenetic tree, we just have extant species that are labeled on our leaves. The trees that we're dealing with, which I'm going to call M tumor trees, sometimes in the literature they're called clonal trees, are a little bit different. So here our vertices are representing our different tumor populations or our clones. The edges are the ancestral relationships. And we'll put labels on here on when a mutation first occurred. And so that's really assuming our infinite sites assumption. So the important thing to remember about this representation is mutations are inherited by all their descendant populations. So I might actually think about this as being underlying it, representing our different populations where this mutation A occurred here actually exists in all of these descendant populations. Okay, so the key observation for us was looking at this is these trees are not the same. And in particular, something that's really important is if you look at any pair of two M tumor trees, they're not necessarily going to have the same set of leaves because we're allowing our mutation labels to appear in different places. And so a lot of these consensus methods really relied on that fact. Uh, furthermore, we might end up with situations like this where we have multiple mutations labeling a single vertex, and that's something that just doesn't happen with our traditional phylogenetic trees. So, all right, none of these methods there are useful. So for me as a computationalist, this is awesome. I'm like, excellent, I've got a problem I can work on. Um, so importantly with that, whenever I have a problem that I want to work on, one of the first things I think about is how do I actually formulate this as a nice, clean, computational problem? So here we define this as the M tumor tree consensus problem. So we're given a set S of these M tumor trees and a distance measure between these two M tumor trees. And what we want to find effectively is going to be a, a median tree. And so this is going to be a tree that minimizes the total distance from our tree that we output to all of our input trees. So uh, 
well-defined input, output. I could go walk down the hall in my computer science department, hand this to anyone who doesn't know anything about biology, and they'd go, oh, I know how to work on this problem. All right. So one thing I want to look a little bit at here is, well, what are possible distances that we could use between trees? Like, how do we define this? And so at the point in time when we started doing this, there wasn't really a lot out there that we thought we could use. Um, so for this, we came up and we sort of generalized a couple things that had been existing in the literature. So we used this one thing called path distance. So this is really a distance measure that was defined for traditional phylogenetic trees that we modified to be able to work in this situation. Uh, we then also defined three other um, little distance measures that are each measuring a different feature of our trees. So parent-child distance, all this is really doing is looking at the set of parent-child relationships. So A is a parent to B, B to C, B to D. And it's taking the symmetric difference between the sets of these between my two trees. Uh, Ancestor-descendant distance is doing the same thing. It's just generalizing it to ancestors' descendants. And then clonal distance is just looking at, well, what are the set of mutations that are inherited by each of these clones? And again, what is the symmetric difference between these sets? So we've got four different really simple distance measures that are just generalizing some things that we had seen used in the field. Okay. So now we've got our problem that we want to solve. How do we actually solve that? All right, so we start with our set of input trees. And the first thing that we needed to do is we say, well, if we're going to come up with a consensus tree, we need to know what our set of vertices for this tree are going to be. So we need to do some type of clustering of mutations. So in particular, we were looking at things that were doing uh, types of consensus clustering. So we came up with a little greedy algorithm here. Um, I'm putting this on the slide so that you can see it later. You don't have to read through all the details. Really all this is doing, it's a greedy algorithm that says if mutations appear together more than half the time, we're going to cluster them together. You can use any type of consensus clustering algorithm here. All right. So once we have our set of clusters of mutations, we're going to build a graph on these mutations. So we build what we call this parent-child graph. So our vertices, again, are our clusters of mutations. Our edges are representing possible ancestral relationships. Possible meaning they exist somewhere in our set of input trees. And we're going to weight those edges based on uh, how often they appear. And so the weighting function that we're using here actually, you know, when I first saw this, I was like, what are we doing here? I did, like, where does this come from? So let's, let's dive into this a little bit. So I've got this function here, count. And so all this is really doing is saying in my set S of trees, how many of those trees have X as an ancestor to Y? One little funky thing with this is what happens when you have mutations that are clustered together. We don't actually know what order those appeared in. So by default, we're always going to consider those to be ancestral to each other because they could possibly be. So the simplest thing that we might think about doing this is, if again, if we maybe ignore for the moment having mutations that are clustered together, maybe we just weight our edges by the number of times that ancestral relationship appears. So A ancestral to B appears in all three of my trees. Uh, because I want to do minimum spanning trees later, we might do that as negative, negative three. The problem with that is if we start thinking about uh, vertices that have multiple mutations on there, so there's multiple possible ancestral pairs. So any edge that's connecting to a vertex that has multiple mutations might be arbitrarily overweighted because you're looking at multiple relationships. So that is why we end up with our edge weights with this function that allows us to basically say, if an edge appears more than about, in about half the trees, it's going to have a negative number. If it's in the less of the trees, it's going to have a positive number. That's all that that's doing. So we've got our weighted edges. Now we can say, all right, I just want to find all min weights spanning arborescences. And arborescence is just a directed tree <coughs> in this graph. I'm going to say, those are all my possible consensus trees. And there's lots of algorithms out there that exist for solving this type of problem. So we combine this all together. This is what we call uh, our graph-based approach to our algorithm for phylogenetic consensus, or graphic. Uh, of course, you always have to have some sort of fun name, and this is what my students came up with. Um, one of the nice things about this approach is it has some provable uh, properties. So we can show that it's actually solving a, a particular variation of our MTTCP when our distance is parent-child distance. So it's nice. It's going, definitely going to solve that problem for us. Okay. So I just want to give you just a brief glance of one pl application of this. So we looked at a data set uh, that was some chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients where they had um, five samples from different time points. And so we applied a stochastic approach, Philo WGS, to this. So the nice thing about this data set was there was both bulk sequencing and targeted amplicon sequencing. 
And so when we ran the stochastic method, we ran it a whole bunch of times and we found every tree that it possibly found in any of those possible runs. And so we ended up with four possible trees from the whole genome data set and four possible trees from this uh, targeted deep ample con sequencing. So we've got eight different, pretty similar, but all distinct trees. So we applied graphic to this data set, and interestingly enough, it returned a ninth tree that was not actually in our input data set. Uh, and so, of course, we're going to be a little bit skeptical and say, all right, well, what's different here? Why, why should we believe this? And so if we look at this, and so this is the tree that graphic returned. This is the tree that was originally reported by Phyla WGS. And so they're exactly the same, except for this one mutation that's labeled 11, that Phyla WGS clusters here, and graphic pulls down as to a descendant in this population. And so this is really interesting. If we actually start looking at these input trees, we notice that this mutation 11 in the deep sequencing data is also pulled down in each one of these, but it doesn't show up in the sort of the lower resolution whole genome data. Um, furthermore, we found some other uh, methods that had analyzed this data set that also had pulled this mutation down as sort of a separate um, lineage. So in some information that might support that, hey, we're actually getting something interesting here that wasn't reported from the initial um, runs in this method. So again, this is just one example of how this might be useful and used. Okay, so I want to sort of transition to something that's very much related to it. In fact, it's a project that directly came out of graphic. Um, it's thinking about, well, how do we actually compute these distances between trees? How do we measure that? Um, so what we did for graphic were some methods that, again, we just generalized things that existed right away and we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about them. And we said, all right, what really is the right way to do this? And so there's a lot of different applications where thinking about problems like this can actually be really important. Um, and so in particular, the big one has been mentioned multiple times. David mentioned it yesterday. Sergey was mentioning it earlier today. It's thinking about how do we do benchmarking of these different algorithms? So in particular, with all these new inference algorithms that are coming out, how do we actually compare these outputs to ground truth if we're doing something with simulated data? Um, you know, we can build on top of that and say, well, what if you have a whole bunch of different tumor evolutionary histories? They might be ones that are consistent with a single patient's data. This might even, if you want to generalize thinking about across patients and looking for common patterns of evolution, can you start doing clustering? And a lot of clustering approaches are really gonna rely on having distance measures. Um, and then lastly is the one we've already seen, thinking about how you can do consensus or summarization of these different sets of trees. So again, we're gonna be looking at M tumor trees, just like we looked at before. So again, our labels are showing us when a mutation first appears. And again, we're, we're assuming this infinite sites assumption for now. So once a mutation appears, it never disappears, and it only ever appears once. So again, we can go back and say, all right, well, what's been done with traditional phylogenetic trees? There's lots of distances there. But again, we can't apply those directly because we're dealing with a fundamentally different type of data structure with our tree. So we, we started off at the drawing board going, all right, well, what are really the important features that we want to capture when we're thinking about what makes two of these trees different? And so the thing we wanted to think about was how are mutations inherited? Because there is this underlying subclonal mutation inheritance process that's going on in these trees. So if we look at these two trees, and in particular, I want to think about two mutations, six and four, which appear here on this tree, and they're here on this one. And so we can think about, well, what's, what's shared amongst those? Well, the populations of colones that get those mutations, well, they're both inheriting some of the same mutations here. So here they might inherit one and two, where over here those populations are inheriting mutations one and five. So we can think about what's shared about their mutation inheritance. We can also turn this on its head and say, well, what's different about it? So what are mutations that are maybe inherited by this population that are not inherited by this other population? And how do those differ between these two trees? Okay. So I really want to sort of formalize those ideas of thinking about how these mutation inheritance properties are different. So the first thing we're going to think about is what I call common ancestor sets. And to make things a little easier, we're just going to think about one of these trees to start. So for any mutation, we can think about, well, what is the ancestral set? So what are the set of mutations that are inherited by the clone when that mutation first appears? Or if you want to think like a computer scientist, just what are the mutations on the path from the root to that vertex in your tree? And so we have these two different ancestral sets. If you want to say, well, what are the mutations that are commonly inherited? 
we can just take the intersection of those two sets, and that gives us our common ancestor set. So mutations one and two are the mutations that are commonly inherited by this clone and this clone down here. So we can compute that for both of our different trees. We get two different sets. And so now, rather than thinking about what are the differences between two trees, we're thinking about what are the differences between two sets. And that's a problem that there are lots of things out there that we can do to compute that. So we use something really basic, sort of the Descartes distance, um, which allows us to compute the difference between these two sets. Well, we can do this for every pair of unordered mutations in our tree, and I get a whole bunch of these different distances. And then all I'm going to do is I'm just going to average those distances together. And that is really what we call cassette distance. So it's just the average Jacquard distance between these common ancestral sets over every pair of unordered mutations in our tree. So our second distance is going to take the same basic approach, but we want to think about now instead of what are mutations that are commonly inherited, what are mutations that are inherited uniquely by one mutation or clone but not the other. So I can think about this thing that I'm going to call a distinctly inherited set. So now the order of the pair of mutations I'm thinking about really matters. So here, this is the set of mutations that are inherited by the clone where four first appears, but are not inherited by six. So if we look down here, that's going to give us mutation three, four, and nine are inherited here, but they are not inherited by this clone here. Similarly, this means that we have to look at the opposite order of these, so I can flip my parameters around. And so the only mutation that's distinctly inherited by the clone where six first appeared but is not inherited by the clone where four first appeared is just mutation six. So we can generalize this. I get to just thinking about how we do set operations, and it's just going to be the set difference between our ancestral sets to compute these distinctly inherited <coughs> mutations. So again, we can look at our two trees. We can compute for each ordered pair of mutations now what the set is. We can use Jacquard distance to compute the distance between these two different sets. We can do this across every single pair of our ordered mutations now. So we're going to have more of them that we're computing because 4, 6 is going to be different than 6 and 4. And once again, we're just going to do the most straightforward thing, and we're going to take the average of these. And this gives us our disk distance, or distinctly inherited set comparison. So we've got these two different distance measures that are looking at these different types of subclonal inheritance patterns. Um, so there's some nice properties about these. We can show that these are both actually valid distance metrics on M or tumor trees, so that's a nice thing to be able to think about. But if we start thinking about, all right, how do we actually apply this you know, in the wild on some real data? Is this going to be you know, useful right away? And so one of the first things that we started thinking about is, well, it's actually not uncommon that you have two trees that have different sets of mutations in them. So why might this occur? The, some methods automatically remove some mutations from consideration. They might say, oh, we think this might have a copy number variant, so we're not even going to consider it. We're not going to put it in the tree. Our two trees might be looking at one's using bulk sequencing, one's using ultra deep sequencing. So you might have this situation like this, and I've got mutation 10 here and 11 here that's not in the other one. So what, what do I do with those? How do I, how do I generalize this? So we could do sort of the most naive thing and just say, all right, let's restrict both trees to the same set of mutations. But you're losing information if you do that. Um, so I might actually really care that, hey, this one was actually able to place this mutation. I really want to incorporate that and know that that really is different than here than just ignoring that. So the way we do this is all we're going to do is we're going to actually restrict the set of mutations that we're doing this sum over. So the pairs of either ordered or unordered mutations that we're considering. And so the simple way that we do this is we consider either taking the union of all mutations that are there. And so we know that, all right, we can define the Jacquard distance if we've got an empty set as one of our input distances. Or we consider the intersection of those pairs of mutations. And so the important thing to note when we're doing this is it still allows us to compare the Jacquard distance of sets that contain these unique mutations. So we're only changing what we're doing our sum over, but those mutations might still add to our distance as part of our Jacquard distance. So we've got a whole bunch of different ways of now computing these distances on these trees. So one of the things that is really hard, and we've spent a lot of time thinking about with this, is how do you evaluate something like this? I mean, the whole idea is this is intended to be a metric we can use in evaluation when we're doing benchmarking. 
And so we've done a bunch of things, and I'm just going to show you one way that we've tried to start evaluating these is using a very particular application with doing clustering on trees. So I'm just going to show you something where we have a simulated data set where we've got five different families of 50 trees uh, simulated using a different tree simulator. And so the first thing I'm going to show you is just what does a heat map of these different distances look like here? So in these plots, dark means we've got higher distances, they're more dissimilar. Lighter color means they're going to be more similar. And so what we want to see on our methods are bright yellow boxes along the diagonal here. So we're also comparing this against two other methods out there that exist. So MLTED is a method that came out recently, um, but it has a little bit of a different motivation. It wants trees that you know, might be at different resolutions, but could potentially have the same underlying tree to have be computed as the same. And then AD, which is ancestor to descendant distance, which is one of the ones, naive methods that we designed for our graphic. And so we see some interesting things on here. So something like cassette union, we see a pretty good difference of delineation of these clusters. Uh, intersection, we actually see that it tries to group these different groups together. And so when we dig into the data on here, what this is actually doing is it's grouping together trees that have different topologies. So things that are more linear are grouped together and things that are more branching. So this is really showing us that the topology matters a lot more <coughs> for this type of distance than just our labeling. All right. So we also sort of extend on this and say, all right, well, let's do some hierarchical clustering with these. And we need a way to determine how many clusters there are. So we use silhouette distance or average silhouette distance. And so silhouette is just a measure of cluster coherence. So things that are really similar are clustered together and things that are clustered apart should be really different. And so under this, higher silhouette scores are better. And so what we do is we use silhouette score to cut our hierarchical clustering tree at every different level. And what we see is most of our methods peak out at five clusters, which is what we would expect, except for cassette here, which is peaking out at three because it's clustering together things that have more similar topology. Uh, furthermore, at least one thing that's nice on this is really cassette union has the highest average silhouette distance, so we're getting the most distinguishing features on this one. So the, one thing that was really interesting with these data sets is there was actually some apparent um, internal clustering within some of these families. So this is just family E, where we did um, hierarchical clustering of just that one family. What you can see is that cassette is sort of grouping together lots of things in blocks that have the same distance, whereas we see a little bit more resolution with disk. Something like MLTED loses some of this resolution, and Ancestor Descendant is, you know, we see some of the resolution in there, but it's limiting our scale to much less. And so the thing that's really interesting about this that we think is, might be useful is that cassette and disk might actually be really complementary to each other, that cassette is helping us find clusters on more different trees, where disk might allow us to do clustering within uh, particular groups. So things that we're looking at going forward are ways of actually combining these different distance measures. Um, so in summary, I've told you a bunch of things today about how we infer tumor or uh, tumor evolution histories from DNA sequencing data and some methods developed in my lab to really be able to make better use of this output. And so I think this is an area where there's gonna need to be more work going forward in the future. Like this is a great, it's a hot area, but how do we actually make use of the data that's happening? So with that, all of this was done by my students, which are all undergrad students. Um, so graphic was really led by Kaya and Camden, and then cassette and disc Zach and Kieran really took the lead on that, and then Anna at Reed College um, helped us out with it a little bit. So thank you very much.